Right, so after much demand um, and much mentioning that I need to do this, um, I'm finally doing it. This is the first episode of the Macrodisiac podcast. Um, what you can expect from this is me talking to you, um, ranting, probably swearing quite a lot, but actually bring in quite good value as well, I would hope, um, and actually value that you can make money from, um, or just to explore a few more ideas about the global economy, about trading, financial markets, investing, whatever you want to take from it. Um, that's what I'm going to try and give you. Alongside me, I will have um, quite a few different guests on from dis different disciplines. So it might be, you know, in politics, could be someone from a bank, finance, whatever. We're going to we're going to test it out and see how much value we can provide. Um, but really, yeah, it's, it's been something that I have wanted to do for a long time. And it is going to complement the membership, but it will be totally free. But I think that podcasts are a great way to um, really, really get information into your brains because obviously if you're reading something all the time you know you might not take that information in some people learn in different ways some people take in information in different ways um, and I think that if you are a member of Macrodisiac and listening to this podcast things are really really going to become solidified for you um, we've got a special guest on today who I have done podcasts with before that is Mr Adam Webb um, and if you don't know about him, he used to be um, a market maker and trader at Goldman's, um, but now he's been independent for a fairly long, fairly long time. Um, and he still market makes in the energy markets, in options and futures. Um, and he's unbelievably well, what's the word? Um, well-educated, I think he's got a pure maths degree from LSE. He just knows everything about markets. He does live and breathe the markets. Um, and I personally have learned a lot from him. Um, I mean, he does like to shout at people on Twitter a lot of the time, but obviously very, very well-founded for very well-founded reasons, because there are so many bellends on Twitter. Um, me not included, of course. But um, yeah. Let's introduce um, Adam and we'll get this conversation going. We'll really, really try and knuckle down into some deeper concepts and make them understandable for, for those who may not uh, be the initiated to them. Um, I know I'm certainly not part of the initiated to some of these concepts that he goes into. But we're going to have a look um, firstly at the macro environment for the next three months. Um, I produced a few different investment cases last week for uh, MacroDesiac members um, for Q4 and Q1 going forward. We're going to talk a bit about the VIX um, and Adam is going to bring in quite a few of his different ideas there. Um, going to go into NatGas and then we're going to delve into a little bit about what he does at Macro Hedged, which is his service for retail and professional traders that he provides. And then we're going to ask him a few different questions. Um, um, with regards to what are the best lessons for retail traders to take away, um, to develop and to become more knowledgeable about the markets and to actually make some money since, um, I mean, what, 90% of people don't make money if, as a retail trader. So let's welcome Adam. Um, here he is. Adam, how are you doing? I was talking off camera that um, this is the uh, first podcast that we have done since March and it just seems like yesterday that we did those those other two um, the first being the market making one yeah. and the second the the cost of trading yeah I think as well they're uh, uh, they're quite popular they still they still generate quite a few questions I think a lot of people kind of it's it, uh, squashed quite a few, a few myths didn't it so they've been yeah. popular ones. No, absolutely. I mean, um, rather than explaining it each time now, you can just <laughs> literally just send them a YouTube link and yeah. they just go and, go and just listen to it. It's perfect. It's literally perfect. Yeah. But um, I saw you out. You were out with uh, with Ryan down in uh, Headingley the other day. Yeah, good yeah. Night. Yeah, it was a very good night indeed. Yeah, what I remember of it. <laughs> That's always the way with him. But um, anyway, let's get into uh, today's podcast. Um, and something that I have been talking about with um, Macrodisiac members over the last week or so um, are a couple of investment cases for the next, say, three to six months, Q4, Q1. Um, I just want to have a bit of a discussion and a chat about what your thoughts are on the macro environment over the next three months. I mean, we're coming into autumn now, and uh, generally, 
that tends to be you know where volatility picks up and a few things start to start to really happen so what's your take on it well i think you know we, we've still got trade talks and tariffs which kind of in my opinion is still still kind of top of the agenda that's the thing that kind of is the biggest growth fear out of the uh, uh u.s market uh i think be quite interesting as well is the impact of uh, Hurricane Dorian on on U.S. GDP because that always has this kind of delayed knock-on effect. And you have to remember as well as with the Fed kind of constantly saying that they are now data-driven, uh, you know, 0.1 percent, you know, point, you know, even 0.2 percent off any number. Uh, would be interesting to start to aid the Trump case uh, to to ease faster and harder. Not that I believe that's the case. You know, I, I, I'm not. I don't think we're heading for another 2008 Armageddon, which everyone seems to be predicting. Um, but you know, the kind of key themes for me: the tariffs. Where, where, truly, where are the Fed on their cutting cycle? You know, they. You know, history said it goes on for longer, for harder. Um, you know, there. Where are? Where is the U.S. business cycle? Is it, has everyone already overdone this? Uh, new president at the ECB, and well, how will this affect ECB policy? Do they want to come out punching? Um, Brexit. I, I think uh, already. You know, the, the numbers. That are coming out of the UK to me are already saying that there's a there's a considerable slowdown. Now that slowdown might not be driven by wage growth. People are saying that's positive. Jobs are still around, but you know, no one I speak to who is outside of our uh, markets world. If you speak to anyone that's an IT consultant or a lawyer, they're they're seeing a lack of it, a lack of spend coming from large projects. People are on hold. What's going to happen? Um, you know, I, I know some friends that work for a large uh, airline that's that's you know big in holidays, and they're saying they're really seeing a massive decline. Uh, you know, post Brexit now, people believe it's going to happen, which I think will have some. Uh, some some interesting influences. I don't believe we're in some sort of kind of Armageddon type event, which a lot of people kind of started saying was going to happen from a rate rise in December last year to where we are now. Um, I think if you ever wanted to kind of have some sort of apocalyptic type prediction, I think the wheels might come off Trump's re-election. I think Trump will be re-elected and the wheels might come off them. But your question to me was, uh, you know, where are we Q4, Q4, uh, Q4, Q1? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, I think um, there's been a lot of talk about the inverted yield curve, um, the 210 spread, for example. Um, yeah. But what people, it's really, really strange because if you, they always add the recessionary periods over that chart, right? But then yeah. they're predicting recession based on the fact that the 210 spread is inverted. But the recession has always come when it reverts. That's what I don't understand. So they're saying, that, oh yeah, just because it's it's it's, uh, it's inverted now, they're expecting it to happen in the next few months. It's bizarre to me. Yeah. I think yeah. um, I think JP Morgan said that they're looking at maybe 2021 or 2022, and I might agree with them on that actually. Yeah, I, I think I think it's all a bit further out. I think yeah. well, whenever you get, you know, the Fed's always behind the. The the, uh, the 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 cut cycle and that 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 will create an inversion. I think that's kind of quite simple maths. Is that the fr the front's loaded up because that's where the Fed have got it, and the backs the backs forecasting or the, or the, the in this case the the middle of the curve is forecasting it. So I and I, I think I, I think there's more interesting macro plays coming out over the next few months. I think you know escalation in Hong Kong, what's going on in the UK, any any true non-politically massaged outcome of, of China uh, suffering the, 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 uh, from the tariffs is the more interesting players. I think the Eurozone looks like it could slow faster, but you know, will, the, will the new ECB be present? I think there, there are potentially more things that, that you could get some alpha out of rather than trying to dance around an inverted yield curve. No, I agree, and I think um, you mentioned Hong Kong there. Um, mm. I saw a video today that um, protesters started burning Chinese flags. Um, for me, that is that, that is quite a big um, yeah, yeah, massive yeah. risk there because you know, and I mentioned I mentioned about Hong Kong to <coughs> members a few a few weeks ago, or was it last week? I can't remember. Time's all gone mental for me. Um, but the fact that um, people are so angry over there. Um, it seems to be a much, much longer um, 
kind of uh, fraughtness that the people in Hong Kong have faced. And there's only been a spark with the extradition bill. Um, it, yeah. It's way deeper than just that. And the fact now that they're, they're actually burning Chinese flags after the, the, the people's police has, has uh, actually gone in says a lot more to me in terms of um, midterm risk as well. Um, where do you think capital would flow to then um, coming out of Hong Kong and China if, if issues really do start to pick up there? Uh, Japan, Singapore, yeah. Australia, um, the US, that they will pick up those flows. With the euro down here, it seems a logical place as well for, uh, for uh, you know, a, a new reserve currency. I know Russia is dramatically trying to promote, you know, reduce people's dollar dependency. I, I, you know, I think uh, the American administration uh, probably would support that in a way because they're sick of having their currency become that reserve in the sense that they're getting strengthened everywhere at the moment. So they're pro that's probably why they're not bleating back at where every time uh, Russia uh, makes those statements. Uh, I, I think, look, I mean, you can view these whole. I mean, there's been riots in France, in Paris. I think are they still going on? They just don't. They don't even get any coverage yeah, anymore. It's ridiculous. Uh, Ryan told me the other week that they haven't stopped. It's just that no one bothers covering them anymore. You know, there's there's still kind of mass demonstrations. In it just seems to be a kind of a new norm. And it sounds a horrible thing when people are kind of on the streets demonstrating to their civil rights. But what's what's interesting about the 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 the, the Hong Kong face is it's just it's so new to their world. Yeah. No, uh, and there's not really been, there's not really been um, kind of an uprising against uh, the Chinese government, the CCP, hmm. in many years since they've turned to capitalism more and more. Um, so since they've become more market-based and kind of poverty's um, decreased, you know, they've, yeah. they've, they've had the good times, if you want to put it that way. But um, I reckon now the tide's turning um, in the same way yeah. that the tide has turned in most economies at some point um, due to maybe freer markets or whatever you want to put it down to, maybe the cost of land, for example. Mm. But, yeah, um, I think, I, think these, a, they, I mean, these markets are still, they're still growing dramatically. We always yeah. kind of look at these ways. Yeah, we look at, you know, GDP in Germany and France, you know, flat to negative, Portugal still negative. You know, you know, old world countries of, of you know, Western countries aren't growing at all. And yet everyone fires all their accusatory rockets at countries like, you know, Brazil, uh, China, India that are growing, you know, still growing at numbers we've not been able to achieve since the 60s. Yeah, no, totally. And, and, <laughs> and with, and with um, relatively, you know, larger GDP as well, um, yeah. which is which is really, really crazy. Yeah. Um, but I mean, let's get into some of your your real day to day here and, and some of your ideas in terms of the VIX. Um, okay. And in terms of VIX skew, because I know this is something that you wanted to talk about specifically. Now, I kind of find the options market to be a bit of a pineapple, um, where you've got the prickly bit outside and it looks all kind of scary and mathsy. Um, but then once you actually cut into it, you can see that that's where the real kind of sweet stuff is. That's where you can really look at maths and really decide objectively um, how to trade a certain market. So, as, as I mentioned before, we're coming into the, the, the traditional um, kind of autumn volatility period. What do you reckon Vic Skew is telling us at the moment? Uh, you see, right, right now, I mean, obviously, you, everyone's doing the usual kind of comparing front to the third and fourth, and it can highlight panic and a bit of complacency and things like that. But uh, for me, the... The, the the kind of the problem with the VIX is it really just it's displaying an at the money volatility. It's not really displaying uh, what what the future what the future state of the curve might look like. So you can so, some uh, it's kind of it's a weird environment. Is that it, it, they've created a futures contract across that curve, which is which is you know completely logical. But in reality, where change occurs is the skew of that curve. Mm -hmm. And and that, and that's where you know if you if you we're, we're still at the, there's still actually a quite a large forecast of a, a, a considerable downturn getting priced into the ES the whole time. So the the VIX skew is sh showing that that that's something that would happen. But I, I actually think that the 
the VIX itself, still, you know, still can, can, you know, every single time we rally, it gets compressed. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the people then start looking out three or four months out of the calendar, but they're only looking at a kind of minute data point of that. Whereas in reality, if you so to give you an, to give you a kind of example of that is, you know, if you were looking at a four month out VIX, which is the at the money, it's the at the money of where the four month. Uh, contract would be so let's say it's december so you're looking at a kind of where's deck so uh so you're looking at around 29 30 yeah okay but in representative if you've got a downside view there's no way that you'd be playing that there you'd be looking at kind of 20 deltas so you're looking what's the skew doing at the moment and there's still a considerable amount of people that are either you arguably could say they're over concerned but uh, that that bend in that in that skew is is considerable to the downside, and I'm kind of, did we get suckered in last week because we we kind of thought that you know the ES would continue to go down and the and Spoos would would have a sell off. Maybe we did, but um, you know there's that, that there's still that there's still a lot of people thinking that the wheels are going to come off come further, and and the skew's telling me that, but the actual VIX isn't. Right. Okay. So you're essentially playing the, the future belief off of what the current, let's say, spot market is is saying. Is that is that correct for listeners? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, is that you've got so the, the VIX will have so it, it it's wherever the at the money is. What I mean by the at the money is where the current price is. So it's yeah. the, it's usually the lowest point of volatility, and and as you look across the curve, it's just looking at the lowest point of volatility of at the money. If you there's actually the CBOE. Uh, run a, a, a skew index, which you, you can you don't have to be able to trade it, but you can look at it. And there's still there's a lot more value to be had. You know, even I don't know, you could play the contrarian view and sell that at the moment because it's still overpriced and buy the at the money to cover yourself. I mean, it's quite a contrarian view considering the whole world thinks, you know, the, you know the end is coming, uh, and we've just opened this discussion by saying that it probably everyone is a bit over Armageddon reactive at the moment. Yeah. That could be one of those trades that plays out. It's just need very carefully managing uh, and, you know, be, be prepared to chop it pretty quickly. Yeah. So your view then is really to be almost selling this fear or um, being being against those yeah. who, are, who are way too fearful at the moment. Is that is that a yeah, thing to uh, say? A big part of me does kind of looks back, and you know, in this in this phase of the cycle, you tend to see, um, you, you tend to see, you know, the continued corporate buybacks because it's it's uh, it's low cost for them to do that. Yeah. Um, you, you you do start to see a little bit of forced investment. I, I exclude the UK and Europe out of that. I'm talking about the US right now. Um, and you see, th this part of the cycle does seem to kind of show a little bit more of an uptick before the final final squirt until it kind of collapses off. But yeah, you know, I w I wouldn't be surprised to see kind of 3,100, 3,050, uh, you know, touched in this quarter, and then we start to see the Q1 come off. By which time the trade we just talked about would have paid off incredibly handsomely because everyone's panicked about that downside. Um, I think all of Trump's panic news is in, and you know he's he's losing that, you know the 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 50 handles movement every single time, or a percent and a half on the VIX, um, and and people are just looking at data, and the U.S. economy still appears incredibly strong. I mean, you know, you, you look right now, you know. December uh, euro dollars is still pricing another 50 points between now and. Uh, mm. Um, and December. I mean, we tell him it's a, the Fed's going to cut another 50 basis points between now and their December meeting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit crazy, isn't it? Because um, in my view, it doesn't make sense to me that an economy that can't survive on, you know, three, four percent rates, should, you, why would you expect the market to go up? on any kind of fundamental basis if you're just cutting interest rates. If an economy can't survive at higher rates, then there's clearly something very, very broken. Um, and it doesn't make sense to me that Trump is promoting this idea of lowering the base rate to be able to um, kind of, yeah, to give that slack to um, to the economy and to actual businesses, etc. Because it means that they're in trouble. It doesn't mean that they're doing well. If you have to cut rates, there's clearly some kind of some kind of issue. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we, we're, we are in a world of political grandstanding now where yeah. 
you know, and finance to the most part was uh, was kind of had some sort of autonomy. Uh, and now, you know, we're, we're seeing the words of the administration really kind of feathering the nest or even starting to build the, the, the outer frame of their 2020 nest. Now, yeah. if the Fed were late, which they usually are, any of the guys, the bond guys that you will talk to, you know, they'll, they'll always say they're late, they're late into the movement always, that, you know, is, is he preempting the fact that he's inherited a very late cycle economy, which for the first three or four years of any presidency, you look like a superhero, you can do no wrong, and then the wheels come off super quick. So is he preempting that so they can get the election? I still think the trade of our lifetime after his re-election in 2020. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my personal view, um, and it has been this way for, for a while now, is if we look at, um, if we look at Japan, and the eurozone and how they've gone negative on on rates and mm. then compare that to the banking sectors of, um, of of those two economies there's real issue there and i think trump is really really going to upset wall street over the next decade or so um, because if you look at how how far rates have fallen and then compare that straight away with those banking indices it doesn't look pretty. I mean, the banking index, um, I think is the ticker is BKX and XLF, which is obviously the financial financials ETF. If you compare those against the Fed funds rate, you can see that every single time the Fed's gone dovish, yeah, they, they, they've fallen, you know, they, they've collapsed. Mm -hmm. um, or they haven't been able to grow is probably a better, um, it's probably a better phrase to use. So yeah. I think, yeah, he's really going to have it's trouble. Basically, if we're looking at it now, Looking at it now, it's just basically been flat for five years. Exactly. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not broken that 2008 high. So what does that indicate? You know, low rates aren't good for bank profitability. And I think um, Draghi no. was even questioned on that, wasn't he? Um, and Draghi said that, oh, yeah, there's no real findings that, <laughs> that there's any issue with it, and that, which is total bollocks. We can we can tell that from, the, from just looking at a simple chart. Yeah, um, I think... I think I, I would I would certainly say that we're we're living in a in in a world now where that that there's so much fear of people's over leveraged capacity. And what I mean by that is not not so much the uh, corporate corporate fear, but pu the, the 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 public's ability. Mm. Uh, we've we've started to create these new normalized terms is you know you, you could argue if this had happened in the 70s just as an example in the uk or even in the us that they probably would have forced overpayments on mortgages mm. and what we do now is what we just we don't we don't do that so people are living in these crazy you know one and a half percent or they're on base rate plus half a percent deals which they've been on and they're then living to those new means yeah. so when when central banks stress test for everything you know the, the entire economy they look at they say actually now half a percent from from one percent to one and a, to one and a half is crippling because it's got that same impact that was have through the 80s where someone go from eight percent to nine percent it, it just i mean it's just it, we, we've become every single time they 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 they, they, they kind of reinflate the tent so to speak it's just more and more weight bears down on it and and, and that's we, we, there is no more gap there's just there's, there's no there's no air pocket anymore for anyone to go into yeah no absolutely and talking about kind of over leverage um one thing that i haven't seen mentioned recently is actually housing considering 2008 was purely based on housing now i think the mm -hmm. the u.s now has the highest um mortgage outstanding mortgage debt um, on record, I think it's like nine point four oh five trillion dollars or something yeah. like that. Um, I was looking at data the other day for new housing permits, and they're starting to tick down again. Um, and yep. also, remember, you've got you've got outstanding credit card debt. So I think mm. you're absolutely right in terms of people just think that you know one percent or two percent is just normal. When really, no, it's not. It's just purely misallocated capital. Yeah. Um, so when you so when you get that kind of misallocation where you've got people you know filling their boots fully ideally you should over leverage in a, in a lower interest environment but paying down is what's happening is it's not getting paid down yeah. they're re-leveraging again yeah. and uh, and so central banks are now we've become in this world of fear where policy is not driven by the correct policy of, of getting you know m1 supply through to m3 supply we're just basically existing in in a fear of faking m3 supply and just flooding cash into m1 
No, absolutely. Um, I think it's um, it's going to be a really, really tough time, especially for um, those who don't own any assets whatsoever. Because, I mean, central banks are, are looking at CPI inflation, um, and they do not look at anything to do with asset prices, really. I mean, where's the inflation? It's purely in assets. And that's yeah. purely due to, um, you know, uh, risk premium compression and, and low rates as, a, as, a, as an outcome of that. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me as to why people focus so heavily on politics and politicians and never on central banks. Because central banks are the real people that are causing, you know, wealth inequality, if people want to put it that way. Yeah, I, I, but I think what happens is, is that they... It kind of the, the, the shit's pushed under the carpet constantly yeah. and then when something bad does finally occur all the shit's dragged out the carpet and lobbed at that problem as well and so the kind of same thing that happened in the 2008 global financial crisis There's a load of other things the housing market arguably the trigger but then loads of other shit all came out there was just everything ppi insurer every, everyone yeah. lobbed everything the regulators were busy for a decade and what will happen is once this 2020 end of 2020 pop comes every every piece of dry shit under the carpet will come out and get lobbed at that problem and they'll hide the real fact again they would have solved all over the superficial problems yeah. but that you know and i think the problem is many a person's gone bankrupt trying to predict this you know you could argue that you know 2016 you know a lot of people were shorting it saying oh we're late cycle now it's got to come in and here we are 2019 you know not far off the highs for everything yeah. um and I, I just, you know, I, I've kind of stopped. I do, I do genuinely believe wheels will come off after the next election. But I do, you know, I've just kind of stopped trying to think more than a quarter because it's just it hurts your head. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I've not, I've not, um, I've not really looked at the year since since <laughs> March when I made the shittest call ever, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it went up by about a hundred handles. Um, but. Um, <laughs> You know, you, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's either day to day now, or you know, quarter to quarter, if you want to put it that way. And I rarely look at the the US that much, the US indices that much anyway, um, because you know they're just getting the offer lifted nonstop, and it's just um, it, well, you, you're getting the offer lifted nonstop when you make a call. It's going to go to the downside. So maybe it's just my bad luck. But um, yeah, I stopped looking at it that in in that fashion and well, look more at the bigger picture and, and what the what the data is telling me in terms of in terms of uh, more what the macro data is telling me for more micro um, assets. Yeah. If you want to put it that way. Yeah, I mean something I I think could kind of unearth itself more is the you know, just talking about the UK. Um, there's a the, you know obviously the the British government's fascination with the artificial propping of property prices in the UK. Yeah, I agree. As many of your, you know, your listeners might be from all over the world, is that we, we, you know, we were indoctrinated to to become home buyers after the Second World War, and you know that's the best return of assets, and that's how basically the government can control credit. Um, <laughs> and the reality yeah. is, if if my, you you can flip a few houses now and again, but if you actually over a long period of time, they'll never get anywhere near even deposit rates. Yeah. Um, and be interesting to see in a post-Brexit environment, in an environment where interest rates could continue to fall in the UK, where you know recession is uh, is, is is inevitable post that event. How they react, how the housing market reacts when there's areas outside the ripple effects of London that haven't seen the rise yet. You know, you can still in the northern parts of England, you can still pick up terrace houses for fifty or sixty k, mm -hmm. and still and, and and still rent them out, so for the same five six hundred pounds a month. So that the 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 change it's really really strange. One hundred twenty thousand pound property in the outskirts of, of of a city, not not London, you'll still get the five six hundred pound a month. But so will a fifty grand house. For there's this everyone yeah, for that. And there's this massive uh, disconnect between the, the rental curve in the lower end of the market and the rental curve in the upper end in the market, which basically is, is, is screaming to everyone that the entire market's propped up by a government process. Yeah. I mean, if we looked at, um, who was it? Um, was it Persimmon, I think it was? The yeah. CEO of Persimmon when he got the, the bonus. Um, and, you know, that bonus was based on massive subsidies from the UK government. Um, yeah. 
it makes no sense to me why house builders should re be receiving so many subsidies. But I guess it's down to the fact that people think that the housing market, I think globally maybe, um, the problems with the housing market globally will be solved by more houses. Um, whereas in the UK, we have more houses than we have households. So there's a supply and demand imbalance there. Yes. But, you know, people think that that's the solution, just to build more, and it doesn't make sense to me. But yeah. um, so clearly then there's a, there's a problem with credit and where, where uh, credit is being misallocated. And yeah, and I think that, that's, that you just hit the nail on the head. The credit misallocation is easy. You know, if you, you know, I think we've talked about this before. If you have, if you got a million pounds, you know, do you go and buy a million pound house? And they'd be an absolute mug to do that. Hmm. Or you go, you go and buy 20, 50 grand homes, rent them all at 600 pound a month, which is 12 grand a month. You can go and rent a 3 million pound home for five grand a month. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 put, and, and put the seven in your pocket. So <laughs> there is no Smart clearer, material. yeah, there is no clearer way of 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 of, of describing credit allocation, mis the misappropriation of credit allocation in the UK. No, absolutely. I mean, this is why I speak about um, tax and land value so heavily, and mm. removing taxes on labour and income. I mean, if you look at the supply curve of labour, supply curve of capital, and then look at the supply curve of land. Land's yeah. fixed, so there's no net deadweight loss. Whereas yeah. with the other two, there is. You know, you have, you stop working at a certain point, and that's why the Laffer curve's total bullshit as well, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. And the same with capital. You just move your capital abroad if you get to a certain point where you don't want to pay too much tax or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Adam, right? So you talk, spoke to me about Nat Gas. Now you've got a, a little idea on this, don't you? Yes, yeah. So uh, are you are you've got to put up the first chart now? Yes. Yeah, yeah? Let's put up the first chart. Okay. So what you see here is this is nat gas seasonality. So uh, average from 1989 to, to 2018 and the yellow line, uh, average from 2000 is a 10 year average, 20 year average uh, and, the, and the current current price uh, for 2019. So basically what, what this is clearly articulating, whether or not you, you say it's gonna be a, a five, you know, minimum five, 10%, uh, we start to see the, the purchasing of nat gas in the back end of the of the year. Obviously, you know, as as you get the uh, you know the nat gas is used a lot in the air conditioning space, but which you get the the longer the longer summers lingering on where people are keeping the aircon units, and then the cold snap hits the uh, Midwest and the Northeast and the US, and boom, uh, the draws in nat gas come. So, but we're not really in that kind of roll the dice kind of guys where we just sit there long and hope uh, or short and hope. <laughs> so if, if you if you move to the next uh, uh, diagram, which you'll see, which we call nutty for natty, you'll see the uh, blue chart, which is the like nat it. gas, yeah, which they call, uh, which is the nat gas price. What the, the, the area that focuses on the, uh, on the red line, which is basically the call spread value between the uh, 50 delta and the 20 delta call spreads. So irrespective of whether or not nat gas goes up or not, let's, we, we've done some, you know, we could arguably say that the uh, seasonality is in our favor. But what is really a very clear pattern is when that seasonality kicks in, when we overlay that back into, I used the word overlay, I swore I'd never used the word overlay. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, the guys in Nordea. Um, <laughs> I'll be adjusting long Euro forever. <laughs> I'll, I'll be adjusting the X axis in a minute. Um, <laughs> the um, no, so you can you can see in the red line the block that the the, the grey block is the uh, is the area of seasonality we're just talking. So kind of late summer, back end of August yeah. through, uh, we've got that swap over, and there is a real clear pattern that calls become in demand. So our strategy is I don't really give a shit if. Nat gas goes up or not, um, we've hedged out of that. What we're looking at is purely the value that those those upside calls outweighs anything else. So, you know, that's I just you know we'll always take the view that I want something where it's in my favour. I'm getting paid to fund it, so we're actually we're actually selling a call spread. So we're selling the we're selling the 50 delta, buying the 20 delta, and the 50 delta's funding the the trade, and then hedging it 100%. So I'm getting paid every day for it. Uh, and if and, and if we have and if the call spread goes up dramatically, that 20 will outpace the 50. The 20 delta will outpace the 50. Uh, and if it doesn't, where uh, you know the losses are, 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 are limited. 
and the 50 that we've the 50 data we've sold will cover that right. so it's it's a nice you know we you know it's not always it's not for everyone i know people like to have that instant gratification but it's a it's a play that's low risk uh the the fundamentals favor it uh you know so yeah there you go so is this something then that you cover with um macro hedged um, yeah, I mean, it's this, 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 this is actually a trade that went out. Right. So uh, Hugh said to me, don't tell anyone about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting so, there with uh, a new baby, just a bit angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, he's, he's, uh, we did say we would we'll put it out. So, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, the, well, obviously we're not declaring what strikes we've used, but it's yeah, gone out to all macro hedge customers. And uh, yeah, it's, it's it, these are the kind of things we look at. We're not, you know, we're, we're not, Get rich quick schemes. We're just looking for a, a, a you know a gain each month, you know, and you know it's it's been a good year so far. We try and select trades that are very low risk, that are the fundamentals are in our favour and the skews in our favour. So you know if one of them goes against you, if you're fundamentally wrong, then at least the skew will will, will pull you back. So that's you know it's it's slow and steady with us. That's what we're about. So uh, which bores a lot of people. You know they just want to come out there, roll the dice, get himself an IG index account, and pray to God. <laughs> What's wrong with IG? No, we're not going to go. Into that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so so who would you who would you say that macro hedged is for? I mean, I say macro Deziac is for anyone. Um, and then anyone who then just wants to bombard me with the most basic of questions, I say, well, use Google, um, because I, I feel like if, you, if you're if you're not open to learning yourself alongside someone guiding you, then you're not going to get anywhere in this business. Um, I mean, I've pretty much been self-taught with the help of you know people like yourself, you know, older people in the game, people that have been around for a long time, um, and people that have done it. Um, so, who would you say that macro hedged is for? Who's your who's your target uh, client? Uh, I think t- it's a really good question. That is, uh, our target market on the option side is purely, you know, we 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 would we, if anyone says what's the minimum amount to kind of put a trade on, we wouldn't say we say one unit is twenty five grand in the account. So it kind of rules out a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and that's not because of any kind of form of arrogance or anything. It's just you're not, you know. You've got to move yourself away from that kind of dice rolling mechanism. So, yeah. so this this kind of, it's a difficult question to answer. So, so number one is you do find that the guys that maybe they not have so much capital, are so willing to learn, and they're literally busting their ass to they they put they put themselves on our course we've just recently done. They they want to learn everything they possibly can, and they are so studious. And I know eventually that they'll do really well because they're not interested in a quick win. And then you've got people that are very, we've got customers that are very well funded. You know, we've got customers that literally are head in our hands when we put the trade out because you just whack it. You know, <laughs> so so we you know so. We've, there's such a big uh, variance, um, but I would I would say it's certainly not our options offering, uh, our intelligence offering is certainly not for anyone that's kind of in for a kind of in and out for during the day. But we we set up the directional thing, which you know is 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 a subset of the ideas, but purely for the uh, kind of you know forex and ups and downs guys. But you can already see the difference in the profit. I yeah. look at it to myself, you know, one's up. 66% on the year, the other one's up like 12%. Yeah. What, I mean, you know, it's just, and I, I, what I find amazing is why aren't more people coming and saying, holy shit, you know, I'm watching everything you're doing. I just realized we're just rolling the dice in that space. We need to move over to this space. But it doesn't happen because I, I think people like the, the, fun of gambling. They like the excitement, don't they? And I mean, this yeah. is, I mean, you know, it's, it's 21st century. Uh, you know, pub betting, and you know where people would stand outside Lab Brooks in the in the late '90s, or r- race down there at lunchtime, or you know, it just it's become the white collar game, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think brokers have helped. I mean, we've we've gone into this before, but this is one of the reasons why I I focus pretty much 95% of my time on research. I don't look at charts that much. If you look at a chart, you can say, you know, you can flip a coin and say which direction it's going to go in. Um, but if you actually have the the backing of what is actually going on um, in the wider economy, or even if you want to go a little bit more micro, um, you always have that edge because you can discern what is 
bullshit and what is actually you know pushing markets around um obviously for execution I, I look at technicals and stuff like that but intraday stuff i can't do it i can't do it anymore yeah. like, you know i've gone um i've gone three four months at a time where it's been fantastic and then you get another five months where you're just like oh fuck, this isn't working out yeah. Yeah. so it's so much better just to look at the longer term um quarter to quarter um maybe six months that far ahead and then just adjust risk and see yeah. see how you're doing yeah. but Let's go on to a few. This is the last little segment. So, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think my camera might have frozen. That's so all. I just I didn't know if the guys wanted to make an adjustment. Ah uh, no, not, I think it's, I I think it's all good. It, am I moving? It's okay. Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, it's fine. Cool. Sorry about that. That's all right, mate. But um, yeah, just a couple of lessons for retail traders, apart from the one that you explicitly said before <laughs> we started, which is just get up and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to do it anyway. Um, yeah. So just give me give me oh. your three top lessons. Three. Uh, there was we did our we did our first question and answers uh, session on our auctions course yesterday, okay. and I get my be in my bonnet about one thing, and it's the way people say is, we were talking about uh, market by order, and there was some in the course, and there were some questions that came back. Does my broker offer MBO? Right. And does and one of the things I just kind of. It, it, oh, it grates on me so much. Is there is this mystique that people in in you know in a in a in a futures world, you know, arguably it's slightly different in FX. So let's just focus on futures for a second. Is that they believe that their broker is this all-seeing eye that's collecting his order coming in. <laughs> Having a little look at it, and then and then oh, I'll pass that one onto the exchange, or I'll have that one for Bob, and we'll we'll book, we'll knock that against. Like, I think it's difficult for people to say, and you know, kind of answer the question of most brokers. Like my broker, my my FCM, I won't call them a broker. They're a futures clearing merchant out in Chicago. Is usually about five or six risk management guys sitting behind spreadsheets, about twelve admin guy or girls and guys, and that's it. Yeah. And they get told about the trades you've done like 10 minutes later via STP. Yeah. And they don't give a fuck about what yeah, they're they, don't, they don't give a shit. <laughs> they, they just, there's this mystique that goes around that, make, that they are kind of, they exist as, as some sort of controller of our environment. It's not. So my answer to the question was, you know, he said, Do, does, a, does a broker offer an MBI? I said, it's largely irrelevant. There are two decisions you need to make is one, what software are you going to use? Because the routing connectors are what will de define what access you have to the market. CQG, TT, LMAX, uh, Option City, CTS, whatever the names are. Yeah. And then the broker is just a custodian of your risk mm -hmm. and your statement producer. The, and the exchange stands in the middle looking after your money. And I think that's what, if retail don't understand that basic of what they are and where they fit, then fucking stop. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think. Um, one of the one of the big things, um, and as you just mentioned, is understanding what you're actually doing um, yeah. and the components of the market. Because if you don't understand that, then how are you going to be able to understand anything that's going on? If you don't understand where your money is sitting and what happens to your order, literally just close your account down now because you've not done the adequate research at all. Um, and, and I think that that is that that's what. And other people say, "Oh, it doesn't really matter." I'm just kind of looking on this chart here and pressing buy and praying. You know, well, if if it wasn't, I mean, if it wasn't for the 21st century, we'd be opening shops on high streets all across the UK, all across Europe, and all across America, and we'd be putting out, uh, pulling out those roulette wheel terminals and just putting in MT4 trader terminals, and <laughs> and, uh, and letting everyone basically smoke crack next to those. <laughs> So that's and that's all basically all that's happened different. Yeah, it's, no, that, absolutely. That, that's what was happening in the early noughties and the nineties. That's where everyone went to go and kind of exercise their gambling exertion uh, after the kind of, then there was the, the poker boom. Mm. And, and, and all that's happened is it's just moving on. It's just kind of cool gambling. And the, the reality is it's got no concept of any downstream or upstream connection awareness. No, absolutely. Um, I do also think that. Um, account sizing comes into it as well. If you were serious, you wouldn't be effing about with a 10 grand account, you know? Yeah, um, and I, and that's, that's where everyone rocks up as kind of in gambler's mentality. And, yeah. You know, that, and that's where, you know, you hear all these stories of 
brokers that don't really kind of, you know, I, I can use the word broker again because we're talking about FX. It, it's a bit, someone said to me kind of, oh, why are these people, why would they deposit with these companies? And I say, do you check the credit worthiness of Bet365 before you lob 500 quid into them? Mm. It's like, no, oh, no, never. It's like, this is, that's the mentality. It's not like us where, you know, I would ensure that the capital adequacy of my FCM is always covered to make sure and, I, and any, any, excess liquidity i'll pull and put to a different custodian yeah why because it's my business yeah no exactly I do what if i if i'm gonna if i fancy a bet and i love 500 quid about 365 do i check their PL before i do it no i don't give a toss no. and that's how people are see trading yeah i mean this it is one of those things where yeah uh, it's not gambling it's it's a business if you do it the yeah. correct way and yeah. i think a lot of people just don't get that and this um, a lot, it's a crazy lot do. A lot do, you know, we've got, it's oh, really yeah, of course. Yeah, kind of course a big spectrum. Do. We've got some customers that kind of are into the absolute weeds, if anything, overthinking. I'd much rather them be like that than, than the kind of, you know, rolling the MT4 dice. Mm. Um, so, you know, kind of to give people kind of respect, they, they, they do do it. But I think that was two questions, wasn't it? Do you, do you, do you, what else was the other one? Um, just your last one. So there was three. Um, just your last lesson for retail traders. Maybe a little bit more trading specific maybe to do with uh, so uh, i think well i mean the things i would always say is you know el elongate your time frames yeah you know, sitting there you know twitching on one minute charts 30 second whatever you know re decrease the position size to a pl point where you're not sweating in your seat mm -hmm. and uh take a view Oh, if you got if you if you must trade technically take a view where you can remain in a trade for a longer period of time so whatever you were thinking of doing 10 percent of that yep. and start to build some mental parameters into what you're doing people just gonna go balls deep straight away get stopped out half their account and then do it again get lucky then do it again eventually you you'll you will blow up and i think you know reducing your exposure increases your clarity. That's absolutely correct. I mean, that's why I stopped day trading because I realized it's total bullshit. Um, but Adam, listen, mate, it's always brilliant to chat to you. Um, we're going to do it more regularly again. Thank you. Um, and, Much appreciated. Um, yeah, nice to speak to you, mate. Lovely to speak to you again. Cheers, Dave. See you later, mate. Bye. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye. Honestly, thank you for listening to this or watching whichever medium you're on. Um, it has taken me a long time to get to doing my own podcast I think that went quite well to be honest um, and just as a side note I'm wearing a hoodie that says ethics here do your own research don't take any of this as advice because the FCA might come and chop my balls off um, but honestly thank you for listening we're going to do another one the week after next I'm in Barbados next week um, for a little holiday but um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll keep this going and um, yeah subscribe do whatever you must. I'll put it all over the socials. If you aren't a Macrodesiac member, go on to macrodesiac.com, check out the pricing, and um, yeah, let's go make some money.